Welcome back, everybody, to Dr. Sellers Educate. We're happy that you're back as we continue to support you on your journey to achieve success on the CNE exam or to renew your CNE. And remember, we use the term CNE loosely. It is referring to the CNE, the CNE clinical, and the CNE novice. There are different detailed test blueprints if you don't know already. So just make sure you go to the NLN website and print out the detailed test blueprint that's appropriate for the exam that you will be completing. There are two reminders that we wanna go ahead and share with you all. First is that we did complete a webinar a few weeks ago related to the revised CNE detailed test blueprint. The link to that webinar is located right here in this episode so that you can ensure that you are ready in understanding the new blueprint. There aren't major changes. However, we do want you to take time to review the blueprint, especially if you are planning to take the CNE exam within the next few months. The second reminder is that we also completed a readiness webinar on the process to follow to ensure that you are successful in renewing your CNE. Right, so those of you that are on the journey, we um, are going to provide some additional resources as we move forward in our monthly boot camp. But just make sure for now that you review that webinar, you reach out to NLN if you have any questions about the certification process. The portal is very easy to follow and there are great instructions that are given in the portal, the certification portal by NLN. But again, we just want to make sure you take time to review that webinar. And we are continuing our series in this episode, looking at exam analysis A to Z. If you don't have your resource in front of you, go ahead and pull that out. It's going to be Billings and Halstead Teaching and Nursing, and also Dr. Caputi's CNE Review Book. When you turn into your textbooks for Billings and Halstead, primarily is the resource we're referring to today, you're going to start on page 489. What we like about the Billings and Halstead resource is that it gives you in-depth explanation about each of these components that we'll be talking about related to item analysis. Okay, so we're on the alphabet. I already, I know we're almost halfway there. I'm not sure how the summer is going by so quickly, but we want to make sure that you're closing your gaps and that you have the resources you need to ensure that you're going to do well the first time you take the CNE exam. You want to make sure you print out also your study worksheet. Every single episode, we want you to have that, that worksheet in front of you so you can take notes, writing down any muddy points that you hear about, and ensuring that you're going back, reviewing the content in the textbooks to help you close your knowledge gaps. When we talk about item analysis, a big part of it is item discrimination, which we will share some resources and some reminders regarding item um, analysis and specifically item description in this episode. Let's take a look at our practice question to get us started. The nurse educator is evaluating the results of a recent exam. When determining next steps, what action should be taken based on the below item analysis data? We have a PBI of 0 0.33, which is the correct answer. We have a p-value of 0 0.80 and a discrimination index of zero. All right, remember that when you are sitting for your exam, you wanna consider two things. First of all, what is it that I know for sure about the content that's asked about in this question? And then second of all, what is it that the question is asking me? All right, so sometimes when you sit for the exam, especially if you're like me and you have some exam anxiety, Sometimes you can think about what's there and to see something different than what's actually in the question. So remember to make sure you use the entire three hours of your time. There will be 150 questions on the exam. So you wanna make sure you are reading the question correctly and that you are responding based on the question that is being asked, okay? So again, you wanna consider two things, number one, what is it that I know for sure about the content in this question? And then second of all, what is the question asking me? You want to be very clear about that. All right, so let's go back to the question um, or the thought-provoking question and take a look at the four choices. So you have A, no changes are needed. B, the question is too easy, so consider revising. C, the exam validity is low, consider revising. And D, the distractor is ineffective, consider revising. All right, so you have four choices here. Think about, 
Again, what is it that I know for sure? And what is the question asking me? Part of the process and the journey that you all are going on, if you are achieving your c &E for the first time, is that you're doing a self-assessment of where you are today. Okay, so identifying where your knowledge gaps are. And second of all, how are you going to close those knowledge gaps? We continue to hear from many nurse educators that exam analysis and item analysis is a large gap area. So we want to remind you that you have this self-assessment that you can take. And the link is right here in the description of this YouTube episode to make sure you're closing those knowledge gaps. And you are using the resources, Billings and Halston and Dr. Caputi, to ensure that you have the most recent content to help you have a full understanding of these concepts. When we talk about item analysis, there are three primary concepts. So we have item difficulty, item discrimination, and distractor evaluation. What you want to know for the exam is going to be two things. Okay, so first must know is what is the definition? What does item difficulty even mean? Why is it important for an exam? And then the second must know is what are those ranges that are going to help me better understand the story of what this statistical report is telling me. Okay, so as you know, you receive a statistical analysis report after each exam, and you're going to come through that data to determine if it was a valid and reliable exam. Part of that assessment, if you will, or the story that you're kind of pulling together based on the data you're given is going to determine whether or not it was a, a valid and reliable exam. The item analysis piece allows us to take a granular look at every single question on the exam, and the data is listed out on your, your report by questions, okay? So you want to take a deep dive in looking at every single question because that is going to help collect the data to validate whether or not the exam uh, truly was fair and, and designed in a way to help us validate that students were knowledgeable about that content, okay? So again... Two things you wanna make sure you close your knowledge gaps about is the definition for each of these components of, ex of item analysis. And second, what is the range that is the normal range? What is the acceptable range for each of these three indicators? And what is the next step that you should take based on the data that is included on that statistical report for each individual exam question? Okay, so that's a little bit about the must know when you think about these three important concepts. And then next, what you want to think about when you look at that statistical report are these four key questions. Number one, what is the difficulty of this question? Number two, do the options discriminate, right? So the correct answers, the correct answer and the incorrect answer. Is there discrimination between those high performing and low performing students? when we look at those students who chose the correct answer and those who chose the incorrect, we would expect, number three, the distractors are effective if our low scoring students chose the distractors more often than our high performing students. Okay, so I'm gonna say that one more time. When we think about number two and the discrimination, what we're really drilling down on is whether or not our distractors were effective. Ultimately, what we expect to happen is that for the correct answer, our high scoring students are going to more often choose that correct answer, okay? And our low performing students are gonna choose the distractors or the incorrect answers. That's gonna, going to allow us to discriminate that specific question on the exam to determine whether or not the question was a good one if our high performance students did choose the correct answer or if we could, should consider revising it if our low scoring students chose the correct answer, okay? So that's how two and three are related. And then number four ultimately is the um, question that we should ask is, should we keep that question? We're only gonna be able to make that decision based on our review of each individual question on the exam based on the review of the score, the statistical analysis report and the exam review when we meet with our students, that's that qualitative component. We wanna talk more about any questions that perhaps um, did not discriminate well between our high performance students and our low performance students. And we wanna have a conversation about that content. 
Okay, so that's a key step, but we know the first step to ensure that we are creating a valid and reliable exam is by developing a solid exam blueprint that is gonna map content and levels associated with every single question, all right? And we've had a, a couple of webinars about that part, that specific criteria, but if you have questions about that, I would say reach out to us, info at drsoleseducate.com. All right, so you've had a chance to kind of think about our thought-provoking question. If you chose D, you are correct. The distractor is ineffective. Consider revising, okay? And what data point, based on this limited data we have in front of us, gives us that information? And it is the DI or the distractor index, okay? We see it's zero, which means that zero students chose a distractor, okay? Again, this is the limited data we have. And you wanna make sure that you're clear about the data that you're given and what it means in the context of the question. All right, so no changes needed. We know changes are needed because anytime you have a distractor index of zero, you wanna go back and make revisions. And you may say why, and I'm glad you asked that question. Think about the distractor index being zero. What we know is that that eliminates a choice for that student that may be guessing. So if we have four options, which that's the way the CNE exam is still designed, making an assumption that there are four choices, even though we know next gen, there are lots of other options other than just a four choice question or a four, co a four choice answer, we are still following that specific guideline, okay? So if we have a distractor that no student chooses, that means that in an option where you have four choices, that students have an increased chance of choosing the correct answer just by guessing, right? Because now, instead of a 25% chance if they guess one of the choices, they have a 33% chance of choosing the correct answer because there's only three choices because the distractor did not do its job because it did not attract any students to choose that specific incorrect option. Okay, so again, this is a muddy point for you. Just write it down. We want, don't want you to get stressed out about it. Just know that you can come back, review the content that's here on this YouTube episode if you still have muddy points after you review your textbooks, all right? So let's go ahead and take a look at one example. So just go ahead and make a note of all of the four components that we talked about um, in the previous uh, questions that you wanna answer, okay? So number one is difficulty. Number two, do the options discriminate? Number three, are the distractors effective? And number four, should we keep the question and what is the quality? In this specific example, this is the data that we're given, a couple of things that we know based on this data. We know that D is the correct answer and we know the p-value is 0.71 and the PBI is 0 0.42 for the correct answer, all right? And then for this specific question, we know that the PBI um, is 0 0.42, the point by zero index for this specific question. And for this question, the difficulty, the p-value is 0.71, all right? So again, what you wanna think about are number one, what is the difficulty? Number two, do the options discriminate? Number three, are the distractors effective? And should we keep the question? Remember that when we look at a statistical report, we are really looking at a story, okay? So what, does the, what story does this data tell us? We see that for choice A, um, we did have uh, students who chose this answer because our p-value is 0 0.21 and our PBI is 0 0.30, okay? And remember the PBI is all about discrimination between high-performing students and low-performing students. And then for B, we have 0 0.4, negative 0 0.47. And then for C, we have negative 0.29. Okay, so think about what data, what this data tells you. Go ahead and write that down. You can pause this video and come back when you're ready to take a deep dive in looking at the story that this data tells us. All right, so again, our four questions before we go over the data is going to be, what is the difficulty? Do the options discriminate? Are the distractors effective? And last is, should we keep the question? All right, so this is what we know based on this example. We know that the difficulty level of 0 0.71 and a PBI of 0 
indicate good item discrimination, all right? Because we know that the p-value 0.71 is within range. 0.7 to 0.8 indicates that there's average difficulty in this question. And we also know that when we have a um, point by serial index that's positive for the correct answer, that means that high scoring students chose this option more often than low scoring students, right? We always want our PBI for the correct answer to be positive and for the incorrect answer to be negative because that's gonna indicate that low performing students chose those incorrect options more often than our high performing students, okay? And then what else do we know based on the data? That each of the incorrect options have negative PBI indicates that low performing students chose the distractors incorrect options more frequently than the high scoring students. We also know that the correct answer has very good point by serial index that indicator or that range we're looking for is greater than or equal to 0 0.30 and is 0.42. And it has an acceptable difficulty range because we have a p-value of 0.71. And so this is what we know based on the data we were given. Now, as we wrap up for this episode, again, you wanna use um, Billings and Halstead, pages 489 through 490. You're gonna see a section on conducting the item analysis to include the three specific measures that we looked at today, which are item difficulty, item discrimination, and distractor evaluation. I do want to point out, and you'll see it also as you dig deeper into the content, that when you, we talk about the distractor index, just remember that that is exclusive to the incorrect option, okay? That's what the incorrect options are called. They're called distractors. And then I would say that if it's still a muddy point for you, just go ahead and join us in our summer series and our monthly boot camp because that's when we take a much deeper dive. All right, so this is, of course, just a snapshot to allow you to have additional content related to this specific topic. All right, and so we hope this has been helpful for you. Until next time, this has been our focus on exam analysis, looking at specifically item analysis, and we look forward to seeing you in our next episode. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you'll be notified right away as soon as that episode is released. Have a great one, everybody. Bye-bye.